He is immune to pain, and to prove it, he sits on top of a hundred nails without getting hurt. But is this really a miracle, or is it physics? Let us observe. Not very oblivious to pain now, is he? Similarly, here is a trick you see performed for you at many circuses. The elephant walks over the man who remains unhurt. But remove the plank and suddenly he isn't all that strong. Why does this happen? What made these seemingly miraculous acts possible? The answer to this question lies in the term pressure. Pressure is defined as the force acting on a surface per unit area. When a force is applied on a knife to use it to cut an apple, it is transferred onto the apple through the knife by means of the sharp blade that is in contact with the apple's surface. All force that is applied on the knife now gets concentrated on the edge of the knife's blade, which has an extremely small area. The pressure, since it is the force per unit area on the sharp edge of the blade of the knife, is extremely high. The pressure applied by the knife, therefore, is great enough to cut through the surface of the apple. But if you reverse the knife, you find that the blunt edge of the knife does not cut through. This is because the blunt side of the knife has a greater area over which the pressure gets evenly distributed. Since the pressure at any point on this surface is not enough to penetrate the skin of the apple, the knife does not cut. Thus, the smaller the surface area on which a force acts, greater is the pressure there. Objects submerged inside fluids at rest also experience a force upon them. Insert your hand in a bucket of water and you can feel the water pushing your hand upwards, making you feel that your hand has turned lighter. This force, exerted by the fluid on the submerged object, always acts perpendicular to the surface of the submerged object. It is possible to measure the normal force exerted by the fluid on the submerged object. For this purpose, we use an apparatus consisting of an evacuated chamber, which contains a piston attached to the inside of the chamber by the means of a spring. This arrangement is then submerged into the fluid and placed at a certain point. If the piston moves inwards, then we know that the force exerted by the fluid on the piston is greater than the balancing force applied by the spring. If the piston does not move at all, then we know that the spring has balanced the normal force on the piston being exerted by the fluid. Thus, by calibrating the spring, we can measure the force applied by the fluid on the submerged object. The average pressure acting on the object can be defined as the force acting on it per unit area. P average equals delta F by delta A, where P average is the average pressure, F is the force applied on the surface, and A is the area of the surface on which the force acts. In the limiting sense, since the piston area can be made infinitely small, we have the expression for pressure as P equals limit delta A tends to zero delta F by delta A. Pressure is a scalar quantity. It has magnitude, but no direction. Its dimensional formula is ML raised to minus 1 T raised to minus 2, and its SI unit is N per meter square. This unit has been named Pascal in honor of the French scientist Blaise Pascal, who was one of the pioneers of the study of pressure in fluids. The mass of a fluid per unit of its volume is defined as the density of the fluid. Mathematically, this may be written as rho equals m by v, where rho is the density, m is the total mass of the fluid, and v is the volume occupied by it. Fluids with greater density are thicker in nature and are resistive to flow. Similarly, less dense fluids flow very easily. Density has the dimensions ml raised to minus 3. Its SI unit is kilogram per meter cubed. Density is a positive scalar quantity. Liquids are by nature incompressible and hence demonstrate very little variation in density at all pressures. Gases, however, being compressible fluids, vary greatly in density at different pressures. 
Density of water at 4 degrees centigrade is 1 into 10 raised to 3 kilogram per meter cube. This value of density is the standard against which the relative density of other materials is observed. The density of mercury, for example, is 13.6 into 10 raised to 3 kilogram per meter cubed. Its relative density is 13.6. Relative density is a dimensionless quantity. Pascal's Law Every morning after waking up, the first order of business is to brush your teeth. To get toothpaste out of the tube, you squeeze one end of the tube and the toothpaste comes out from the other end. Notice that the harder you squeeze on the tube, the greater is the amount of toothpaste coming out. Thus, there seems to be some relationship between the pressure applied on the tube and the amount of toothpaste that comes out as a result of this pressure. This relationship is known as Pascal's Law, and the tube of toothpaste is one example of Pascal's Law that we see in our daily lives. Pascal's Law states that in an incompressible fluid, pressure exerted anywhere in the fluid is transmitted equally in all directions throughout the fluid. Let us carry out a small experiment. A glass beaker is filled with water such that three-fourths of the volume of the beaker is occupied by water. We take some matchsticks and break the wooden sticks attached to them such that all we're left with are the match heads. These are put into the glass beaker. The match heads tend to float on the surface of the water. The open face of the beaker is now covered by stretching a membrane on it. The membrane is stretched absolutely tight. The apparatus is now airtight. Using your finger, press the membrane inwards gently and observe what happens to the match heads. We see that the match heads stop floating and submerge into the water such that they lie slightly below the surface. When you remove your finger from the surface of the membrane, the match heads rise up to the surface again. Thus, the pressure exerted by your finger on the membrane was transmitted into the match heads, causing them to sink. Releasing this pressure relieved the pressure on the match heads as well, causing them to rise up to the surface again. Thus, pressure was transmitted through the fluid, demonstrating Pascal's law. This can be proven mathematically as well. Consider a prism immersed in a fluid. This prism is extremely small, such that every part of it can be considered to be at the same depth from the liquid surface. Thus, the effect of gravity at all these points is the same. On the faces A, B, and C of the prism, the fluid exerts a pressure PA, PB, and PC, respectively. This pressure corresponds to the individual forces FA, FB, and FC acting normal to the three surfaces. The area element of each of these surfaces is given by AA, AB, and AC, respectively. By equilibrium, then, FB sine theta equals FC and FB cos theta equals FA. By geometry, we have AB sine theta equals AC and AB cos theta equals AA. Thus, dividing the first equation by the second, we have FB by AB equals FC by AC equals FA by AA. Since pressure P equals F by A, we have PA equal to PB equal to PC. Thus, the pressure on each face of the prism is the same. This proves that the pressure exerted by the fluids is equal in all directions when it is at rest. Variation of pressure with depth. Let us fill a large beaker with water. Water in the beaker is at rest and hence is in equilibrium. Now, inside the beaker, consider a cylindrical element of height H and cross-sectional area A. The upper surface of the element experiences a pressure P1, and the lower surface, lying H meters below it, experiences a pressure P2. Since the fluid is in equilibrium, horizontal forces add up to zero, and the vertical forces are such that they balance the weight of the assumed cylindrical element. Let the weight of the fluid in the cylinder be Mg. The pressure P1A acts downwards onto the element, while pressure P2A acts upwards to balance it. Using this information, we can write the equation P2 minus P1 into A equals Mg. 
Mass of the fluid is given by M equals rho HA, where rho is the mass density of the fluid and HA is the volume of the cylinder of a height H and cross-sectional area A. Therefore, our equation becomes P2 minus P1 equals rho GH. If this cylindrical element were to be assumed such that the upper surface of the cylinder is at the surface of the fluid, then P1 is the atmospheric pressure, PA. Replacing P2 by P, we get P equals PA plus rho GH. The excess pressure at depth H given by P minus PA is known as the gauge pressure. Notice carefully how this equation does not contain the area element of the cylinder. This means that the pressure at a certain point depends on the height of the column of fluid above it, but has nothing to do with the cross-sectional area occupied by the fluid. This property of fluids leads to a phenomenon known as the hydrostatic paradox. Imagine six vessels of different shapes kept at the same height. The basis of each of these vessels is connected to each other by means of a horizontal pipe, as shown. Water is now poured into the pipe. Observe what happens now. As water is poured into the pipe, it reaches equal heights in all three vessels simultaneously. This shows that water at the base of each of these vessels is at the same pressure. The reason why this is a paradox, or at least appears to be one, is that we would expect each of these to have different pressures at the bottom, on account of the amount of water occupied by each of the vessels. Atmospheric Pressure and Gauge Pressure Atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the air present in the atmosphere. This pressure differs at different altitudes. Higher altitudes have lower atmospheric pressure, while lower altitudes show higher atmospheric pressure. At sea level, atmospheric pressure has been measured to be 1.013 into 10 raised to 5 pascals. This value is a standard reference and is denoted as one atmosphere. Measurement of atmospheric pressure was first made possible by the Italian scientist Evangelista Torricelli who invented the first mercury barometer. The mercury barometer consists of a glass tube about three feet in height, which has one end sealed, while the other one is left open. This tube is filled with mercury and is placed in a reservoir containing mercury, such that the open end of the tube lies inside the reservoir. Mercury is chosen to be used in a barometer for a number of reasons. Mercury is dense and hence forms columns, which would not have been possible if we were to use a fluid like water. Column formation is extremely important to the functioning of the barometer because pressure variations are measured by variations in the height of the column of mercury in the glass tube. More important is the fact that mercury expands or contracts evenly with temperature, making it easy for the user to calibrate the barometer, depending on what the temperature is. Mercury also does not stick to the walls of the glass enclosure. Pressure is exerted by the atmosphere on the mercury in the reservoir. Pascal's law ensures that this pressure is transmitted undiminished to the mercury column in the glass tube. This causes the mercury to rise inside the tube. The height to which the mercury column rises depends directly on the pressure on the mercury in the reservoir. At sea level, the height of the mercury column is found to be 76 centimeters. We know that P equals PA plus rho GH. P here is the pressure in the mercury column, and PA is the atmospheric pressure which acts on the mercury in the reservoir. The vacant space above the mercury column in the tube is evacuated and contains only mercury vapor, which exerts only a negligible amount of pressure. Therefore, rho equals PA minus rho GH, or PA equals rho GH. Pressure is often measured in terms of the height of mercury in the column. Pressure corresponding to 1 mm mercury in the column is denoted as 1 tor in honor of Torricelli. 1 tor equals 133 pascals. Another commonly used unit for meteorological measurement is the bar and the millibar. 1 bar equals 10 raised to 5 pascals. Another instrument used for measuring pressure differences is the open tube manometer. 
The open tube manometer consists of a U-tube, which contains either a low-density oil for measuring small pressure variations, or mercury if the pressure difference is large. One end of the U-tube is left open, while the other end is connected to the system whose pressure is being measured. The system exerts a pressure P on the fluid in the manometer. This pressure P is also the pressure exerted by the system at point A of the manometer. A corresponding point B can be defined on the other side of the manometer as having the same pressure as at A, once both points A and B are at the same height. The open end of the manometer experiences the atmospheric pressure PA upon it. The distance between the top of the column and the open end of the manometer and the point B can be measured. Substituting this in the expression for pressure we learned earlier, we can measure the gauge pressure P minus PA, which is the pressure difference we needed to measure. P equals PA plus rho GH. Hydraulic machines. Let us begin this section by carrying out a small experiment. Let us take two syringes and fill them partially with water. Both the syringes are connected together using a rubber tube. The tube is connected to each of these syringes such that they are watertight. Notice what happens when we push the plunger of one of the syringes inwards. We see that the plunger of the other syringe moves outwards. We can also observe that the plunger moving outwards does so only as much as the plunger that was pushed inwards. Pressure applied on one plunger, therefore, was transmitted completely to the other one. This is because, as Pascal's law states earlier, pressure applied on an incompressible fluid is transmitted through it undiminished. Hydraulic machines work on this principle in a manner similar to what we have demonstrated in our little experiment. Let us look at how hydraulic lifts work. A hydraulic lift consists of two pistons, each with different cross-sectional areas, working on a reservoir of hydraulic fluid. A force F1 applied on the piston with the smaller cross-sectional area A1 is transmitted into the fluid. This pressure P equals F1 by A1 is transmitted through the fluid to the piston with cross-sectional area A2 resulting...